Uh, and one other point, those of you who don't know, Angus, uh, well, he doesn't really follow the standard conventional fashions of the day. Uh, he, his hair looks like he does it every morning by sticking his head inside a screaming jet engine. Uh, his beard is long, flowing, unkempt, and if he were ever marooned on a desert island, he could survive for months on the nourishment that still resides in his beard. <laughs> so, he's decided to run again. This is a little bit from early uh, in the campaign, and then I'm happy to, uh, uh, to take questions. The look on the hair and makeup woman's face was priceless as she first laid eyes on her next subject, or more accurately, her next project. Perhaps even her life's work. Angus and I have just arrived for a taping at CBC's flagship public affairs program, Face to Face. As Angus settled in the chair facing the light bulb bordered mirror, Sally, as her name tag revealed, stood behind him and just shook her head. Time to break up the heavy artillery, she said before disappearing out the door. Angus gave me a puzzled look in the mirror. Now, Sally really hasn't worked on anyone lately with quite your sense of style, I venture. Angus looked at himself in the mirror, trying in vain to quiet the riot boiling on his head. I can't help it. My hair's always been a wee bit mutinous. Sally returned, rolling a cart with an array of tubes, jars, and aerosol cans, some of them still wearing their Home Depot price tags. <laughs> that wasn't a good sign. <laughs> Sally is listening to a green spot and was pulling on rubber gloves when a younger woman, similarly spot, arrived on the scene, drying her hands on a towel. She too donned rubber gloves. They faced Angus and me with their hands held up in front of them like surgeons before operating. I'm Sally, and this is Rebecca. We're in touch this morning, so she'll be assisting me every step of the way, said Sally. Are you fixing to give me a heart transplant, Angus inquired. I wish it were as simple as a heart transplant. But our first priority this morning is to tame your hair so that we can actually get it all into the shop without having to rent an IMAX camera. <laughs> and we have exactly 13 minutes. Battle stations. Sally turned to Rebecca and nodded her head in my direction. Rebecca immediately grabbed my elbow and ushered me out of the room. I'm sorry, Mr. Addison, but unless you're a family member, you won't be able to stay for this. I assure you, Professor McClintock will be just fine, but it's best if you wait in the green room. I sat down on the couch and watched the TV monitor on the wall as the clock ticked up to the top of the hour. In the meantime, Sally and Rebecca sprang into action and they did their thing. And they did it very, very well. Despite what I imagine were howls of protests from Angus, they worked a miracle on his unruly cranial strawberry. On the monitor, the show opened as usual with the host, Brad Palmer, sitting across a sort of counter from his guest. It took me a minute or two to recognize Angus. He still resembled Angus, but he somehow seemed smaller. <laughs> his hair was quite neatly sculpted, but what actually looked like a part demarcating the eastern hemisphere of his head. Whatever had been applied to his hair shone under the lights. His usually scraggly beard appeared to have been combed out in a Robertson Navy's kind of style. <laughs> Welcome to Face to Face, I'm Greg Palmer, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Maverick Liberal MP Angus McClintock. Thanks for coming in today, Professor McClintock. I'm happy to be here, but you can just call me Angus, everyone else does. What made you, this? What made you jump into the race this time to run for re-election? You really had no intention of winning the first time around. Ah, uh, it's a fair question, you're right. Sitting and serving in the House of Commons was the furthest thought from my mind last October, even though my name was on the ballot. But my unexpected stint on Parliament Hill was a revelation to me. I enjoyed it. I felt as though I were making a contribution. I was surprised, but I felt fulfilled. And strange as it sounds, I was unhappy at the prospect of surrendering my seat to another, when I was feeling as if I were just getting started. Angus's hair still looked pristine. Sally joined me in the green room to watch the interview next visit. So you're confident that you can win re-election despite the very strong Tory tradition in the riot, Brett probed. Bother Dutch. It would be the height of arrogance for me to be confident about the liberal win this seat again. To be clear, it wasn't elected on my own merit the last time around. A flash of faith put me in the house. This time I'd like to win the seat in a more traditional fashion by persuading the voters of Cumberland Prescott that I'm worthy of their support over all the others. 
I expect it to be a very tough fight. Whoever the constructors put forward. The first signs were imperceptible to me. Now they pick up on them right away. Left temple at the midpoint of his ear. We've got a bulge. Oh, damn, we've got a bulge. In 10 years, I've never had a stage four shellac failure, but there it is. And she was right. If you look closely, you could see asymmetry emerging in Angus's hair. We were only two minutes in. Beads of sweat appeared on Sally's upper lip. How would you feel if you were to face Emerson, the flamethrower box in the campaign? That's his rumor. And I'm less concerned with the candidate I might be facing than I am with the many challenges Canada's already facing as this recession takes hold. But to have the courage to read Mr. Fox's memoir, and it is quite enlightening. Right bulge now, Mr. Sally. It's only a matter of time at this point. They better cut the commercial soon. Of course, she was right. Angus's hair was starting to lose its sleeve and scalp and look, and now had more of a... Bozo the Clown vibe. <laughs> but according to Sally, it was a very dynamic situation and it would get worse before it got better. A typical boss campaign comprises muckraking, innuendo, and backstabbing. Aren't you a little daunted by the prospect of being in the flamethrower's crosshairs, given his reputation for politically dismembering his opponents? I don't intend to play that game. The voters deserve to hear about the issues this country must confront. I really don't think they're interested in a campaign driven by personal attacks. We want them to vote, not turn away from democracy. I'll have no part in a negative campaign, regardless of what my opponent might have in mind. And if he does try to appeal to our base or instincts, I'll be doing my level best to stay on the high road, however much, however much I may wish to punch out his lights. <laughs> Back in the green room, Sally was about to climb the walls. The two side bulges on Angus's head had burst into a full rebellion. It was as if every hair of Sally and Rebecca had carefully flattened, was now struggling with considerable success to stand straight out and break free from his head. It looked, well, bizarre and otherworldly, and there were no Hollywood special effects. This was 100% all natural Angus. Sally and I both saw them at the same time. Uh-oh, Sally whispered. What are those things? I asked, squinting to identify the blondish streaks that suddenly appeared on both sides of Angus's head. Toothpicks, Sally <laughs> said. Toothpicks? Uh, most people just carry them in their pockets, I answered. How did they get in his hair? Well, we need a little, or rather a lot of structural reinforcement to get his hair to comply. Those toothpicks were holding the bulk of his mop flat. It's a new technique recently developed in a small cloth college in Romania. <laughs> the procedure is still being perfected. Oh, so you mean the toothpicks aren't supposed to pop up and stand up like that? <laughs> Sally said nothing. By this time, his beard seemed to be moving all on its own as the fine, comb straight lines began to vibrate and curl. What's that? I pointed to the screen again. Oh, damn, I thought we'd got them all. This is heading south in a hurry. Uh, it almost looks like a kernel of corn, I said, squinting at the pale yellow nub in the lower left quadrant of Angus's beard. Yeah, but that beard is thicker than a Brazilian rainforest. For all we know, the cob could still be in there somewhere. <laughs> Clearly, the producer in the control room was no longer transfixed by the slow motion transformation of Angus's head. I saw Brett's right index finger zip to his temple as if to prevent his earphone from flying out. Brett looked down, listening. Uh, um, Angus, uh, we're going to take a quick break now. That said, before turning to face the camera. So stay with us, and we'll be right back with Liberal MP Angus McClintock. I opened her mouth to say something to Sally, but she had bolted through the studio like a cheetah on a gazelle. <laughs> I imagined her attacking Angus's hair and beard as an anxious producer counted down a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> 